So good evening. Uh, thank you so much for coming out and sharing a Friday night uh, with us. I want to say thank you to the Flagstaff Festival of Science. I think it's pretty cool that we have this opportunity here in Little Old Flagstaff to um, hear some pretty amazing things uh, over this 10-day period. And it doesn't cost us. It costs a lot of other people um, time, resources, and money, but it doesn't cost us a dime. So that's pretty nice. So thank you for that. Um, again, tonight, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story about regenerative medicine. And regenerative medicine is a field that is a lot older than you might think. Uh, it's about 200 years old. And it really refers to trying to encourage the body to go through its own repair processes. And it's probably much older than 200 years, depending on what cultures you look at or you pull from. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about where we've come from, where we are today, and then where we're headed in the future. So if we look first at the past, we see that um, about 200 years ago, we first started doing successful blood transfusions. This is from one patient to another, one human to another. And it says successful, so that means that there were years before that that it wasn't successful. Um, and that's just in Western society. And this was usually postpartum hemorrhage that we were trying to treat in those days. And so that's when a woman's, a woman's pregnant, after she gives birth, a lot of times a lot of blood is lost. Um, it could be a risk to the mom. So they would experiment with moving blood from one patient to another. We look at the 1950s. Now I'm, I'm moving quickly through time right here, okay? To the 1950s, now we start doing big things like transplanting organs. We had our first kidney transplant in 1954, our first successful bone marrow transplant in 1956. Uh, we move forward into the 1960s. Now we're starting to play with pancreas, kidney, liver, and the first heart transplant in Texas. In the 1970s, we get, again start playing with blood. And so we're looking at uh, platelet-rich plasma. So this is a process where we draw the patient's blood, we spin it down, and then we collect a middle fraction of that layer. And it's very nutrient-rich. It's full of many growth factors and cytokines. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit later about PRP in more detail. The 1980s, we wind forward. We see more successful transplantations with a variety of different organs, including corneal transplants. The 1997, uh, first on the market is a tissue engineered skin. And this skin was a biosynthetic skin. So it was a polymer scaffold, and then we would grow skin cells on it. And I worked at this company before I came to Flagstaff to work at Gore. And so it was a bioengineered in the laboratory skin that was the first of its kind before the turn of the millennium, right? And the FDA approved this technology. That's the Food and Drug Administration. They said that it was safe and effective based on clinical data, clinical trials. And this is still sold today. And its cousin product, which is the next generation product, is continuing to be sold today. So even before we hit the 2000s, we have done so much in this space of trying to encourage the body to heal on its own or facilitating that restoration of function. So where are we today? About half a million Americans are benefiting from a transplant in some form or fashion each year. Our tissue engineered skin products, um, they're going to replace diabetic foot ulcers, cover uh, skin wounds, treat um, uh, burns in patients. We look at uh, Tony Atala's work uh, at Wake Forest University. We have a tissue engineered bladder now that's available for patients. Um, Dr. Stephen Badalak's work out of Purdue, he's now over at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, small intestine submucosa. He actually takes um, porcine or pig tissue, the intestines, sausage casing, takes the cells out, and you can see on the lower right picture that fabric or that, that sheet of material that's actually tissue that's being used to uh, treat urinary incontinence, to heal wounds, to cover ulcers, all sorts of different applications. We're told by the end of this year we'll have a tissue engineered cartilage on the market. There's really only about three months left, so I've been watching this company very carefully, but they still claim on their website that we'll have a tissue engineered cartilage. This will go into worn out knees, Joints, hips, how many of you like this idea? Okay. <laughs> we have in the preclinical stage, right? So not in patients, but in the development phase, 
we have tissue engineered vascular grafts. That upper right picture is showing a tube that's a replacement blood vessel. We're treating in preclinical models and allowing for this blood to reperfuse critical organs like the heart or like the brain or like the liver. And then we advance very quickly to today and where I'm gonna spend quite a bit of time right now talking and that's stem cell therapies, okay? So there's a lot of conversations about stem cell therapies in the, in the newspapers, on the media, um, on social media. And so I'm here to share with you a little bit about what that is, okay? But we're playing aggressively in the last 10 years with a lot of different stem cell therapies, okay? And that's where a lot of my research now currently focuses. What are stem cells? So basically, they're a cell that is pluripotent. That's a fancy word that means that they can become many different things. So they're a progenitor cell. They have the ability to turn into something else when they grow up. They could become muscle tissue. They could become bone. They could become cartilage. And like all of us, when we're young, we're influenced by our environment. And so our youth respond to the environment around them. And cells, like stem cells, do exactly that. They're immature cells. You put them in a certain environment that's an environment that codes for bone, they turn into bone. You put them in an environment that codes for muscle, they turn into muscle. And there's been a lot of researchers that have understand those mechanistic processes. So our environment influences us, us tremendously, not just as an organism, but at the single cell level, which is quite fascinating. So there's been a lot of um, energy focused on stem cells. So here's a picture of a cell dividing. It's a video, actually, of a cell dividing into two cells. And this is what happens in utero during development, in the womb. You go from a single-celled organism to a multi-celled human in about nine months. It's one of the most regenerative environments that we know of. It's designed intricately. It works seamlessly most of the time. Right? We all hear and we all focus on all the bad news, but there's a lot of great times that it happens exactly the way it was designed. And these cells, as you can see in this video, they're turning into something else given the environment that they're in. Now, you can't see the environment very well because a lot of that environment is soluble. It's in solution. There are growth factors and cytokines floating around in solution. Every now and then you see something cross the screen and you can see there's stuff floating in there. Those are providing cues or signals to those cells to encourage them to turn into something else. And that's exactly what they're doing. Now it looks like they're growing bumps, right? Those are exosomes. Those are the cell's way of sending signals outside to its environment, telling its environment where it's at. So this process that you're watching right here is happening in Flagstaff, in our laboratories, in my labs. It's happening all over the country, all over the world. And people are looking at ways that we can influence cells to turn into replacement tissue. Now, what's fascinating is we used to think about stem cells as we should deliver them to a patient to repair some sort of problem. But interestingly enough, all of us have stem cells within us in most of our tissues. Almost all of our tissues have stem cells within them, and we can just encourage them if we can trigger them to actually awaken. How do we do that? Well, we could actually deliver to them those cytokines or those growth factors, those are just chemical signals, the stuff that's floating in that media that those cells are growing in, and we can encourage them to respond and become new muscle tissue, new cartilage. Okay? We can cause them to become new skin tissue. And so that's the field of stem cell technology that's happening today. And a lot of companies, a lot of clinicians are delivering stem cell therapies. Um, some of them have stem cells in them, supposedly, um, but a lot of them aren't using the stem cell technology anymore. They're delivering these growth factors and cytokines to cause your resident stem cells to awaken and do what they no normally know how to do. Okay? One source of these growth factors and cytokines, those, these nutritional factors, comes from this platelet-rich plasma that's been known about for, since 1970. Take a blood draw, you get a sample of blood, you put it in a fancy machine called a centrifuge, it spins it, separates these layers okay, by density. You grab the, a middle layer that's that platelet-rich plasma layer. That's where all those nutritional factors are. That is what's injected into a damaged knee 
or a damaged ankle or a damaged joint. Or it's what's injected into a wound. And I'm going to show you some of those examples here in a second. But the question that I have for you is, if that patient that you pulled blood from is 12 years old, how young are those growth factors? They're 12. What if the patient's in their 40s? Well, they're middle-aged growth factors because the cells that are making those growth factors are middle-aged. If it's a geriatric patient population in their 70s or 80s, those cells that are manufacturing those growth factors are older. So where could we find a younger source, non-controversial younger source, of growth factors in stem cells? Well, we look at the womb again. So we go back in utero, and again, 10, 20 years ago, we were talking about embryonic stem cells. Lots of controversy. Today, we're talking about adult-derived stem cells, the stem cells that are present in you and I, and also after birth is when it becomes adult, not just early or late in life. That's the division line, is after the baby's born. So after the baby's born, there's tissue that's available that's rich in stem cells, and it's discarded tissue. So for example, the umbilical cord, the placenta, they're biohazard, they're thrown away, they're discarded. Well, in other cultures, some of the nutritional value of those tissues has been well described. They use it as fertilizer. In some cultures, they actually consume it, the placenta or the afterbirth. So what we're doing in our labs is we're actually harvesting the stem cells from donor placenta after the patient uh, has delivered the baby, mom and the baby are celebrating, and instead of throwing it in the trash, we're essentially reusing it. We're pulling those cells out of it. We isolate it out of the amniotic layer, which is that inner layer, and then we grow them in cell culture media in the laboratory, right here in FLAG, and then we harvest the media. We leave the cells behind. We don't deliver the stem cells to the patient. We just deliver those growth factors and cytokines. But they're from a very young source, right? They're from this neonatal tissue that's typically thrown away, but just got done providing nutrition for a nine-month process that's an amazing regenerative process. So how can we stimulate your own cells to awaken? Well, we can deliver these growth factors and cytokines. And we have some young sources that are available. We could go to PRP platelet-rich plasma, like we've been doing since the 70s, or we can actually reach to younger sources like cord blood or amniotic-derived tissues. So let me show you some of the results. So these are patients. These are humans. Uh, this was on the left slide. This is an x-ray, okay, a radiograph, and this is at the ankle. So this is the bottom of the shin, right above the foot. That's your ankle joint. And you can see that the distance of that space in this 80-year-old patient is 2.55 millimeters. Patient was complaining of joint pain, uh, irritation, couldn't golf anymore, liked to walk the golf course. That was the big problem, right? No more quality of life. But as an 80-year-old patient, wasn't a great surgical candidate. That's risky. So the surgeon said, let's try this regenerative fluid, this amniotic-derived fluid, uh, and treated the patient. A year later, we have a two millimeter increase almost a, uh, an increase 2x of what it was. Now the patient is actually walking the golf course, avoided surgery, um, actually got another injection a year later, and we're following that patient, and we're going to um, uh, take, a, take a peek at it um, 18 months, 24 months, and continue to follow this patient. Uh, but these are the kind of results that we're seeing with these regenerative fluids. Here's another one. This is a younger patient. This is a patient in their 40s. This was an ankle fracture. So on the right side, or on, the, on the, your left um, picture is uh, the baseline x-ray, and you can see the blue arrow is pointing to a black line. That black line shouldn't be there. And if I zoom in a little higher magnification, you can see and appreciate on the right side that little box inset that's blown up. Hopefully you can appreciate where that black line is. That's the fracture. Now on the right side, the right image, that's 30 days later. No surgery. They were weight-bearing the whole time, and they decreased their healing time by a factor of two to three, right? A ha half the time or potentially a third of the time it, it healed um, much, much faster than normal. Usually this would take two to three months to heal with surgery. It healed in, in one month. Okay, so this next picture, I want to just provide a warning. This is a wound. So this is a, an open wound. 
Uh, it's not horrible, but if you're a little sque squeamish, I, I picked one that wasn't all that bad. But it's horrible in the sense that it's been open for five years. Okay, you guys ready for it? You can look away now if you need to. So this wound is on the back of the ankle in a patient. This is an 81-year-old patient that's wrestled with diabetes uh, for about 30-plus years. They've had this open wound for five years. Okay? So it's not a young patient, and it's not a new wound. Okay? It's not healing. And if you look carefully at the wound, if you look at the wound margin, or if you find the tissue around the wound, it's raised. It's inflamed. It's scarred. And that's because it's trying to heal for the past five years. And they've tried everything. The physicians have tried everything. So we treated with part of that amniotic membrane. We put that in the middle. And then we injected the fluid around the edges. And we injected the fluid into the middle of the wound. Obviously, they were under anesthesia. But the patient doesn't feel much anyways. They suffer from parathesis or a numbing and tingling, kind of when your foot goes to sleep. So that's what they suffer from all the time. And that's why this wound showed up. So here it is. Two days later, here it is nine days later, here it is 16 days later, okay? And so 16 days later, they can wear pants, they actually have a sock on, it's covered, it's treated. This is an 80-some-year-old patient, I think it was an 81-year-old patient. So we're seeing these kinds of stories again and again and again. And so we ask ourselves, what in the world is going on? But the physicians call this the million-dollar wound because... Five years of treatment with all those professionals and all the different technology they tried, um, they say affectionately, this is a million dollar wound. Patients extremely happy, families extremely happy. But these are the kind of results that we're seeing today, right now, in, in 2018. Where are we gonna go tomorrow, right? And so I wanna finish up the talk with where we're headed. So this is a timeline and there's a lot of information on the screen, but what I wanna point to is in 1953, we first discovered um, the shape of DNA. We knew that DNA was there earlier than that, but Watson and Crick actually got credit for it and kind of claimed credit for it. Uh, it was actually a graduate student, but it's a long story, who discovered it, um, and, and she didn't actually get the credit for it, but I just gave her the credit for it now, so you can Google that, right? Um, 1953, Watson and Crick get credit for the double-stranded DNA shape. And then in um, 2001, the human genome is totally sequenced, which is kind of an interesting story. Uh, there's a great uh, book on it by uh, Francis Collins, and he was directing the Human Genome Project, but it was truly an effort between academia um, or the federal government and industry. They were both racing to first uh, uh, sequence the human genome. But after 2001, we now see products coming out on the market that are recombinant. So we can take the DNA sequence and we can put it into another organism, like bacteria or a plant. If you hijack bacteria or a plant and they end up dying, nobody complains, right? And then you harvest the insulin and you treat diabetic patients. You can do that with erythropoietin. And so these products that are recombinant are a direct result of the human genome sequencing. We also see proteins. We can make tissue. We know the gene sequence, and we can make tissue like tropoelastin. So if you grab your skin and you pull on it, uh, and let it go, it snaps back, and that's because you have elastin in your skin. We can actually make that in the lab, and that's what we do in my lab. So we take this sequence of DNA, and we express it in bacteria or in plants, and we make tropoelastin as a protein. That's the stretchy part of the content of your skin. Your bladder has it, thank goodness, right? <laughs> Otherwise, half of you would already be gone, okay, because I saw there was a bar out there. Um, and your blood vessels have it, your heart has it, and that's what gives an elastic component like an elastic rubber band to those tissues. Well, the gene for elastin turns off about the age of 12, and you don't make it anymore. And you're left with the elastin that you're going to have for the rest of your life, but it has a half-life of about 70 years. So that means when you're 70 years old, you have about half the elastin you had when you were born. But that's why our skin looks different. Well, that's the organ you can see. That's what's happening inside the body as well, okay? Bladder, blood vessels, heart. Same kind of processes are happening with age. If we cut off that leader sequence, we make it liquid. We cut off that leader sequence, just like the cell does, and it spontaneously cross-links. This is like what happens, everybody's familiar with superglue, right? It's like a miracle. 
chemistry miracle. It's in a bottle and it's liquid. You squeeze it out and it becomes a solid. That's how your body makes tissue. It starts out as a liquid. As soon as it leaves the cell, this leader sequence is cleaved and it starts forming these fabric sheets. So the nice thing is we can actually shape it because we have it as a liquid. So we can actually make things out of human tissue in the laboratory. So this is the three-dimensional architecture of tropoelastin that's shown on the screen right here, right? Wouldn't you like to see that over your kitchen table? That kind of, I'd, love, I'd love to have that framed. But we can make tissue. We can actually fabricate it. We can, we can do different things with it to make tissue sheets. We can make cardiac patches to treat the heart. We can make tubes, blood vessels, and we can actually make skin. And so I want to focus on skin. This is a bioartificial skin that we make in the lab. This is what it looks like, okay? Those blue dots, those are skin cells, human skin cells that are growing on our bioartificial skin that we've made. <clears throat> this is a wound model that we use. This is a preclinical model. And this little box right here, this green box I'm gonna blow up, this is the regenerated or the healed skin after six days, okay? And you're like, okay, it looks like black and white. Who cares? Well, all of those open spaces, the black open spaces, that's where those blue cells would live. And all of the white that you see is the architecture, the scaffolding that the cells live on. And the algae I like to use is, it's like kids on a jungle gym. The cells are the kids and the jungle gym is the scaffolding. And cells have to have something to attach to. So if you go back to this picture, you can see that they attach very nicely to that scaffolding. So if we give them a scaffolding like this, they actually regenerate. There's normal skin on the lower left. That's the architecture of normal skin. The artificial skin scaffold that is regenerated in six days in this model is in the middle. And if you didn't put the artificial skin, you just let it heal, you put some antibacterial ointment on and a, and a Band-Aid, you get a scar, and we all know that, and that's what a scar looks like on the, on the lower right. So now we have the ability to promote wound healing with more favorable outcomes because we can deliver a tissue that resembles the native tissue. Where are we going? Okay, this is from Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Uh, give them credit for the video. These are biological processes of repair and regeneration that have been around for a long time. They're in a lot of different organisms, and they're in you and I. Now, the newt, the salamander, the axolotl, has a tremendous ability to regenerate, and biologists have known that for some time. The stem cells that are found in those limbs and in the limb bud, if you sever that limb bud, those stem cells in that area know exactly what to do. They know the programming that's necessary in order to regenerate an entire limb. So the question is, is that where we're headed? Are we going to be able to regenerate body parts or tissue ourselves? What is it that's happening within the newt or the salamander in this video that allows this process to take place seamlessly every single time? And it doesn't just create a stump. It actually keeps going, right? It grows new bone, new muscle, new architecture, even new digits. And the programming is in the DNA, and the stem cells are the precursor cells that know exactly what to do and how to make that happen. So if I was to be asked where are we headed, I would say sky's the limit. I don't know the answer to that question, but if you go back 10, 20 years, nobody would expect the clinical results that we see today happening right now real time. Thank you.